Okay, this next lecture will be on the abdomen and gastrointestinal system. This is kind of a long lecture, so hang in there. Um, it's just over 100 slides. We'll go through it quickly. All right, you have some outline um, of the GI system, of things you need to know, and your objectives. Make sure that you're able to um, define what each one of these are and some of their characteristics, what they look like on imaging. Um, the main goal is for you to be able to look at an image and say, that doesn't look right or normal. Okay, so whether you know what it is or not, the thing is, is that you know that it's not a normal looking stomach or bowel or whatever. All right, so key terms right there. So physiology of the GI system. The basic function of the GI system is to alter the chemical and physical composition of food so it can be absorbed by the body and into the cells. It's dependent upon secretions of the endocrine and um, exocrine glands and it's controlled movement through the intestinal uh, ingested food through the tract and it's for absorption to happen. Most of the absorption, if not all the absorption, happens in the small bowel. So um, the abdomen is divided into abdominal and pelvic ca uh, cavities. There's nine regions, four quadrants, and the abdominal cavity has the stomach, intestines, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, kidneys, ureter, and spleen. The pelvic cavity has the bladder, portions of the intestines, and all the reproductive organs. If we look at the... Um, different regions versus the quadrants. So um, you'll need to know the different regions when you're talking to a doctor and the different quadrants. A lot of times they'll say uh, left lower quadrant pain or right upper quadrant pain. So we don't typically use the regions, but a lot of times you'll hear epigastric pain. Um, so you'll know exactly what they're talking about. Okay, so looking here on the layout in a mid sag view, you can see um, where everything is within the abdominal and pelvic region. Important that you know your anatomy. And looking here from the mouth all the way through um, the esophagus to the stomach, and you can see the liver and the gallbladder here. Um, so you have liver, gallbladder, you have the mouth, which is the first part of digestion, down the esophagus, into the stomach, into the jejunum, um, ileum, and then you have your ascending colon, transverse, descending, sigmoid, rectum, and anus coming out. So um, liver, and you see gallbladder there, you have your ducts. The stomach here, so it's... The main things that I want you to know is, you know, you should know your esophagus. It comes into the cardia. Um, we call it the cardiac sphincter right here at the stomach. Here's the fundus of the stomach. If a patient is upright, you're going to see air in there. If the patient's supine, you're going to see barium in there if you're doing an upper GI because the stomach lies um, with the fundus more posterior. So you have your greater curvature around the outside and your lesser curvature on the inside. We get more... Um, ulcers on the lesser curvature, and you have your pylorus down here, um, and your duodenum coming around. So we get a lot of ulcers on the lesser and in the pyloric region. Okay, so the small bowel. Um, we have the duodenum, so it's the gastric antrium, and the ligament of trites. Now we care about the ligament of trites because it'll tell us if there's malrotation within the patient. So the bowel is going to come down and then loop back up before it goes the rest of the way into the small bowel. So you can see the jejunums in the left upper quadrant to right upper quadrant. Ilium is in the lower quadrants and to the ileocecal junction going into the large bowel. And um, you'll see the large bowel. We have the cecum, the orifice for the terminal ileum. We have a lot of Crohn's in that area. We're always looking for Crohn's there. And you have the appendix for, um, we're look at, 
looking for appendicitis. You have the ascending colon with the phatic flexure, the transverse colon with the splenic flexure. You have your descending colon with your sigmoid rectum and anus. So first part of your small bowel is your duodenum. It's coming off of the pylorus to the duodenum to the jejunum to the ileum. And just more pictures for you. And you can see the anatomical structures here in uh, display. And you can see down here on a barium enema, you can see the terminal ileum right there where the small bowel comes into the large bowel. All right, so you have your retroperitoneal, uh, intraperitoneal. So the retroperitoneal is your cecum ascending colon, descending colon. Your intraperitoneal is your hepatic flexure, transverse colon, splenic flexure. And um, peritoneal is your sigmoid, and extraperitoneal is your rectum. All right, so when we're looking at imaging considerations uh, of the abdomen, we usually go to a KUB. KUB stands for kidneys, ureter, bladder. Um, we look for placements of tubes and catheters. We're looking for obstructions or perforations. We want to look at the anatomy. Um, now, everything is kind of the same shade of gray, so we have to play with our contrasts, our KVP and our mass to get a really good image so we can see the differentiations between the shades of gray. Um, we look at the gas pattern. Is it... Um, over on one side, is it diffuse throughout? You know, we look and see to make sure that that is normal. And we can do it um, upright or in a left lateral to cube. So if a patient has an obstruction, we need to see the layering of the fluid versus the air. And it'll have like a complete step off. You'll see a straight line between the fluid and the air. Then you know that there's an obstruction. So if the patient can't stand, you need to roll them into a left lateral decubitus in order to see that layering. You will not see that layering on a supine KUB. Okay, so this is a KUB, and as you can see, we have just normal diffuse gas patterns throughout. You can see the large colon, which usually has air within it, and fecal matter, um, totally normal. All right, radiology of the GI system, what we do is we do endoscopes, CT, colonoscopy. We do a combination of fluoroscopy and radiography, and we can give contrast agents so that we can see the bowel better. Um, for the esophagus, we'll use thick and thin barium. We do it for dysphagia. We can do a dynamic video. Um, we call them um, swallow function videos, or there's a million different names. They're all the same. So a dynamic video fluoro, so we look at achalasia, we look at uh, spasms, we look for aspiration um, for patient protection, especially after a stroke, very common. So as you can see here, the patient has barium in their mouth and we tell them to swallow and we look at their swallow mechanisms and make sure that it's going down only through the esophagus. As you can see here, we have trace penetration going into the trachea. This is your trachea. You can see your cricoid rings here. So you can see a little flash penetration of um, barium going into the trachea. So um, we usually will tell the patient to cough to get make sure we get all of that out of there. Um, there are times where they'll take a drink and you'll see the outline of the full trachea. So this study is really good for looking for aspiration. Okay, so the stomach, we evaluate the contour, um, positions, rugae, and uh, paralytic changes. So we will administer glucagon and um, we'll also put gas producing substances. So glucagon helps relax the bowel so it's not spasming so we can see it better. Um, we'll use compression, so there's a leaded glove or we have a paddle to move the bowel around so that we can see if there's any adhesions for structures um, uh, that would cause blockages. So um, some of the views that we do is PA, REO, LPO, um, and right lateral. Those are the best way to see the stomach. So um, pretty standard. Um, we usually start with LPO, then we'll go AP, REO, or RPO, then we'll go right lateral, but you can also do it PA, REO, LPO. So, different ways to do it to get the same view. So here we have the fundus of the stomach. It has barium within it. And we have the lesser curvature here, the greater curvature coming around. 
here's our pylorus going into our small bowel duodenum. So the small bowel, um, what we do for small bowel studies, we take KUBs over a specific period of time. Typically, it takes two to three hours for it to reach the ileocecal valve. Once it hits the ileocecal valve, we're done. Um, but there are times if there's a blockage that it will take days. So these studies can go on forever. Um, we also do intercoliasis where we'll drop an NG tube down into the stomach and really far down into the duodenum and we'll inject contrast so that we can see the small bowel. So if a patient can't tolerate drinking it, we'll just drop an NG tube down into the duodenum and we inject the contrast. We also can do uh, MRI and CT um, intercoliasis studies. So here's small bowel. So you can see the lesser curvature of the stomach, greater curvature of the stomach. We have our pylorus and going into our duodenum. Here's your ligament atrites. And then you can see here we have the jejunum going into the ileum. And you can notice that there's a difference in the pattern of the small bowel. That's how you know if you're in jejunum versus ileum. And then coming down and around, and we're going into our terminal ileum, into our large colon. So that means we are finished. Yippee. All right, large bowel. We usually do a bare minima. Um, we can do single or double contrast. When we talk about double contrast, we're talking about putting air and barium within the colon. We do spot radiographs um, during the study and afterwards. We're looking for inflammatory bowel disease, surgical uh, changes, colostomy, ileostomies, um, different ways of doing it. So here, this would be an air contrast BE. And you can see the markers on for the right side. So we have um, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. And you can see the tip in the rectum. So CT, so visualizes small density differences. It's really, really good for seeing the differences in the anatomy. Used to image inflammatory conditions, uh, neoplastic lesions, or treatment planning for radiation therapy. Um, patients should do a bowel prep prior to doing the study. There's virtual colonoscopy and CT colonography. So it's 2D and 3D. So what we do um, is we put a tip in the rectum, we fill them full of air, we scan them, and then we flip them over and we scan them again. So um, lots of fun, lots of fun. So um, yeah, I've done my share of those. And here is a post-processed into the coronal plane CT. You can see our liver here, stomach, spleen, this is small bowel. This right here is large bowel. So that's typical for large bowel. And the characteristics, we have the hostra. Um, so they're the little wavy pieces in the bowel, where small bowel doesn't have that. It looks more fluffy. Down here is the bladder. So this is your psoas muscles coming up and your ilio, um, ili iliac arteries. Sorry. All right. So MRI. Looking at MRI, it's limited to bowel. Um, as the scans get faster, we're able to see the bowel better. So um, we'll do breath holds on bowel quite a bit. Um, I've scanned a lot of um, bowels for mesenteric arteries for occlusion and for ischemic bowel, um, different reasons prior or prior pre-surgical, um, if they're going to be resecting the bowel, we will do studies of the bowel and MRI. So um, it's great for pediatric and pregnant patients. So if I have a pregnant patient, um, they get all the time hydronephrosis. They also get appendicitis when they're pregnant. So um, it causes a lot of problems when you can't do an x-ray because of the pregnancy and where the baby's sitting, we can't see. So you don't really want to radiate them in CT because it's a lot of radiation to that baby. So we'll do an MRI and we'll limit it. We'll just do real quick sequences um, and take a look and see if they have appendicitis or if there's a kidney stone or if the baby's just laying on the ureter causing hydronephrosis. So um, a lot of times we will not give contrast. When we do give contrast, we just give a little bit and we take a look to see what's going on. Um, 
really cool to do those uh, in MRI because you get to see the baby and it's so cute. All right. So anyway, um, we do T1 weighted, T2, um, 3D, um, we'll do MRAs. I don't run those on pregnant patients, but we do run MRAs of the abdomen looking at the mesenteric arteries and making sure that they're intact. And we'll do MR enterography. So that's the MRE. So that's where we give them a bunch of contrast to drink over 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, and have them drink bottle, 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 bottle. And it's a negative contrast. And then we inject contrast and we scan them. And it's a beautiful study. It's beautiful. So. Here is a study here. This one's pretty, pretty, pretty. So if we look, we have the liver here, and it looks like kind of a fatty liver, so it's pretty dark. It's not normal for it to be quite that dark, but um, who am I to judge? Um, we have the stomach. You can see the transverse colon. Here is our ascending. This is our cecum. Um, it's pretty enlarged. It's interesting. Here's our small bowel, and here's our descending um, going into the sigmoid. So really good study. Really nice. They did a nice job. All right, sonography. Occasionally useful in GI, used to image retroperitoneal st structures and is used for appendicitis. We'll also use it for pyloric stenosis on babies. So um, ultrasound is the first line of defense on a kid. Um, usually they, after a few weeks of life, they get stenosis of their pylorus and they get this projectile vomiting that shoots across the room. It's like, oh, my baby throws up a lot. It's like, okay, does it shoot across the room like the exorcist or is it just vomiting, not projectile? And they say, oh, no, it shoots across the room. Then you're like, oh, yeah, then you've got pylorus stenosis. So ultrasound is the first line of defense for that. Then if they, it's suspicious but they're not 100%, they'll come in and we'll do x-ray on them and see do an upper GI and see if it is pyloric stenosis and if it is let me tell you be warned because you're going to give them the barium that barium is going to shoot about three feet out of that baby it is impressive all right nuclear medicine is really good for GI bleeds um, gastric emptying studies so if a patient has food that's retained in the stomach longer than it should be that is great study so the gastric emptying um, urea breath test, so we'll do that to check for any kind of ulcers. Um, Meckel scan, so really good for finding Meckels. Anyway, we'll go into that. And then for GI cancers, we'll do the, um, the PET. And this is a typical scan here for GI tumor. We're just kind of looking all over. So this right here on both sides, that's kidneys. And this is the bladder. So the kidneys and the bladder are processing out all of the radioisotopes. So that's that's normal. We look for that. And when I first started in radiology, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's positive. They're like, positive that they have kidneys and a bladder. Yes, you're right. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, looking here, endoscopic procedures. So we'll actually stick a scope down um, upper and lower. So looking at different um, ulcers of the esophagus, of the stomach, of the duodenum, um, they usually don't go past the duodenum and then they'll go rectally and um, with your colonoscopy. So um, the good thing is they can do any kind of biopsy during that time. And this is what it looks like. Um, we'll do MRCP, MRCPs, ERCPs, um, and where they'll go in through the sphincter of Odi and go in and um, look at the ducts going to the liver, or actually the common bile duct, so it's draining from the liver down. But um, we'll also do it in the colon, and they can do biopsies through that. So MRCP, we can do these without the scope, which is really nice. All right, so tubes and catheters. So we have gastric tubes. Um, we use those for um, aspiration of gastric contents if they, um, for decompression. So if there's a blockage, we can suck out all the gastric juices so that the patient stops vomiting, hopefully. And we can also use it to give patients uh, food and medication. So the Levin uh, tube is the most common NG tube. It's small, single lumen. Um, and it has a plain tip, can be visualized on radiographs, and the proper alignment is into the stomach. 
Uh, Andural tubes, so a small caliber tube, uh, delivers liquid diet directly into the duodenum or jejunum. It has a weighted end to ensure whole, it stays in place. We have a Dobhoff, which is common enteral tube that is radio-opaque. Excuse me, so this is our Dobhoff, and it usually has a tip on it that we can see. So it's coming in, and we are in the duodenum going into the jejunum. So we're at the ligament of trites right there. So that's the proper placement. So here is the tube. Um, you'll see it sticking out of patients' noses, very common. Nasal, uh, nasal intric, intric de, uh, decompression tube. So inserted into the intestinal tract. Um, it has one end, has a balloon on it, it has a rubber bag filled with air, mercury or water, and it stimulates um, peristalsis to facilitate passages through the pylorus into the intestinal tract. There's the Miller-Abbott, which is a double lumen decompression tube. It passes through the nose, pharynx, esophagus, inflate a balloon, and pull back and at the cardiac sphincter. So... You can see the Miller Abbott, it has a balloon and it's gonna sit right in here. So you can see the fundus, the body, the pylorus. Here's your lesser curvature, greater curvature. Okay, so your cardiac sphincter, so it's gonna sit right in here. And here are all of your different tubes. Picture for you to see. Okay, so let's jump into our different types of pathology. So the first one is congenital and hereditary anomalies. So we have esophageal atresia. So the esophagus fails to develop certain past a certain point. So the symptoms include excessive salivation. So they're like drooling a bunch, um, choking, gagging, dyspnea, and they turn blue when they are drinking. So diagnosed by inability to pass the NG tube into the stomach. So radio opaque tube will demonstrate the terminal end of the pouch. Immediate surgery um, is required on these kids. So it's usually when they're born, they have esophageal atresia. So you can have atresia throughout the whole GI system somewhere. So keep that in mind as we go through. Um, the tracheoesophageal uh, fistula is, um, usually goes along with atresia. So there's different types of atresia. Like I said, sometimes the um, esophagus will link directly. So official, it means a connection between two things. So the esophagus will connect to the trachea. So when they drink, it goes straight down to the lungs. So that's not good. Um, uh, prognosis incompatible with life more than two to three days. So immediate surgery. Bowel atresia, discontinuation of the bowel. So ileal atresia is the most common. Duodenal atresia is next, and colonic atresia after that. So the symptoms is inability to pass stool and abdominal distension and bloating. Um, we get a double bubble sign is what we're looking for. So gas from the stomach creates a bubble, and gas from the proximal duodenum creates a second bubble. So we call it a double bubble sign. The treatment is surgery to resect the area and reconnect the bowel. So you can see here, we've got air in the stomach and air in the bowel. So here we've got double bubble. So here's one bubble, here's one bubble. Poor baby. Big distension of the, of the stomach. Esophageal atresia, so you can see we have an NG tube, we're trying to get it down. It's not going past that point. They injected a little bit of um, contrast and you can see it's not going down like it's supposed to. Okay, so anal agenesis. Agenesis means without. So an anal opening to the exterior uh, of the body is absent. So fistula may be present. So cross table lateral rectum or fistula gram best demonstrates the condition. A fistulogram is a procedure to check for blood clots and blood flow in the fistula. So the treatment is surgical correction. So they might have to have a colostomy. So we, we look here and there's a lot of different types um, of what we're talking about here, the um, in, anal agenesis, how I know it, imperfecte um, anus. So if we look here, we can come out, it may end. So there's missing anal opening and it could connect to um, 
the uter into the vaginal canal where um, they're pooping through their vaginal canal on the males they can connect to the bladder um, as you see here you can connect to the bladder um, it's just a mess it's just a mess so a lot of different ways that that can that can be so just want to show you that okay so HPS hypertonic pyloric stenosis that's what I was talking about um, anomaly of the stomach so the pyloric canal leading out of the stomach is narrowed due to hypertrophy or hyperplastic or pyloric sphincter we don't know why it happens but it does signs and symptoms typically dehydration fatigue and um, and fail to gain weight so first line of defense we go to an ultrasound it's the best modality and then we do um, upper GI's as needed and you can see here we've got a big stomach and we've got a narrowing here so um, it's not allowing it to pass through and you can see here just on a diagram how it's swollen and the food particles or milk cannot get through okay malrotation intestines are not in the normal position there's varying degrees there's complete transposition of the bowel really important you use your markers um, if you're doing um, x-ray or if you're an MRI that you put the patient in the correct way so that you are 100% sure that this is malrotation so failure of fixation of the intestinal tract to the cecum often asymptomatic but may lead to volvulus or incarceration of the of an internal hernia so usually we use upper GI and we uh, follow the track to check for deviation of normal routine so we'll look at the ligament and trites to make sure it's where it's supposed to be and we'll do a barium enema to check the location of the cecum it's normally in the right lower quadrant sinus uh, inversus which is complete reversal of all abdominal organs and the treatment is surgical resection of involved bowel to relieve intestinal infarction so the bowel will start to twist upon itself and cut off blood supply so looking here we have all the small bowel on the right side and we have all the large bowel on the left side you can see the terminal ileum is on the left side instead of the right side it's supposed to be right here so um, I've seen this a few times it's interesting all right Hirschsprung's disease which is um, congenital aganglionic megacolon so it's the same thing um, absence of neurons in the bowel wall typically in the sigmoid colon so primary causes unknown is linked to RET pro whatever um, it's also called toxic megacolon it's one in five thousand bursts um, it's usually boys and we you a barium enema to diagnose this so usually we'll do a temporary colostomy and a surgical resection of that part of the bowel so looking here normal oh that's that's the sinus inversus but you can see the size of the bowel and you can see how large this bowel is and this is a baby so um, you see how large and there's no hostra so you see these hostras and there's no hostra so toxic megacolon um, and it's a lack of neurons in there all right Meckel's diverticulum so it's a congenital diverticulum of the distal ileum so these children develop ulcers in the adjacent bowel and repeated bleeding at the ulcerated site um, adolescents and adults cramping vomiting bowel obstructions we diagnose it typically through um, nuclear medicine we can do it with a small small bowel study so surgical resection of the uh, diverticulum is typically what will happen if it's causing problems so you can see it right there just that little sucker that right there all right you can see the meckles on the drawing interesting so sometimes it's really hard to see if they have um, bowel laying on top of bowel that's where it's really good to do the nuclear medicine all right so there's gluten sensitive sensitivity so a lot of you guys have heard about that oh I can't have gluten um, so the celiac sprue or celiac disease so it's increased sensitivity to gelatin gelatin um, fraction of gluten interferes with normal digestion and absorption of food through the small bowel um, bowel dilates mucosal folds atrophy and paralysis and uh, paralysis slows or stops so your bowel will not move things through 
symptoms, diarrhea, gas, weight loss, abdomen distension, um, radiographic appearance is uh, segmentation of the barium. Um, it looks like pieces of cotton and there'll be mucosal changes. Usually they biopsy the small bowel to see and you just need to avoid gluten. So this is what it looks like. So the bowel, this is small bowel. So it gets really dilated and feathery looking. So they call it cotton, cotton ball appearance. So you'll see that. And that this is typical gluten sensitivity. All right, carbohydrate intolerance. Inability to digest certain carbohydrates, including lactose. Can't produce uh, lactase to break down the lactose into simple sugars to be absorbed. So the symptoms of diarrhea and cramping, there's no cure, you just avoid dairy products. So looking here, this is a normal small bowel, right all in through here, and you can see how fluffy this is. So the small bowel is definitely irritated and swollen. So this is lactose intolerant. Esophageal, so now we're in clearly inflammatory diseases. So we have um, esophageal structures. We have a narrowing of the esophagus um, and it occurs in varying degrees, can be secondary to ingestion of uh, causative agents and diagnosed with endoscope. endoscope. Uh, radiographic appearance, unchanged appearance compared to normal paralysis. We've got benign structure, stricture or smooth contour and malignant is it's um, irregular borders, so ragged contour. All right, so you can see here, smooth, smooth, and look how narrow that is. Yikes. So, yeah. What we'll do is we'll um, stick during an endoscope. They'll go ahead and put a catheter through, and they'll blow up a balloon to dilate the... Um, cardiac sphincter or wherever the stricture is within the esophagus. All right, so GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, uh, it's incomplete cardiac sphincter, so it's not closing all the way, resulting in backwards flow of contents into the esophagus. So um, causes is reflux esophagitis, and you get heartburn, chest pain, uh, dysphagia, so um, it's hard to eat. It, it burns, it scrapes, it's swollen um, There's from the acid reflux. And the diagnosis is esophageal um, mandatory, so um, esoph we do a scope, we do a barium swallow, and we monitor your pH to make sure that you don't get Barrett's esophagus, which is actually from uh, reflux and it burns a, the layer of the distal esophagus again and again and again to where you get changes in your cells to where you can get cancer of your distal esophagus. So we do care about reflux and we want to make sure that we um, treat that so that you don't get um, esophageal cancer called Barrett's esophagus. All right, it's increased by chocolate and smoking. All right, so we'll stick a monitor down and we'll measure the pH levels in the distal esophagus on some patients who have really bad reflux. All right, peptic ulcer, an erosion of the mucous membrane in the lower end of the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum, most commonly located in the duodenal bulb or lesser curvature. Um, NSAIDs is usually um, what causes it. So it's pain in the epigastric radiating to all parts of the abdomen, so we usually see it on a scope or a double contrast upper GI. All right, and you can see this ulcer right there. So you see the ring around it, the lighter gray, and you can see the target sign. So we call this a target sign. All right, gastroenteritis, general uh, grouping of a number of inflammatory diseases uh, disorders of the stomach and esophagus. There's erosive gastritis that causes is ingestion of NSAIDs, um, physical stress, viral or fungal infections, ingestion of foods contaminated with salmonella or um, bacteria. 
gastroenteritis, uh, we have burning and a heaviness in the stomach, nausea, diarrhea. We use an upper GI double contrast typically to see it. The radiographic appearance is slit-like um, collections of barium surrounded by radiolucent halos of swollen, elevated mucus. Uh, so the treatment is proper fluid management and relief in nausea and vomiting. So this is gastritis. You can see how thick these folds are. So these folds are really, really deep. That's the rugae, and it's really, really deep. So that is gastritis. You can see here the inflammation. Malabsorption syndrome. So a number of disorders in which the absorption of certain nutrients is negatively affected. So symptoms, uh, fat, light colored stools, um, protein, hair loss, sugar bloating. So the celiac disease is best known, which is your gluten. And we diagnose it through lab tests, barium, biopsies. There's the lactose insufficiency and it's unable to digest dairy. So looking at regional enteritis or Crohn's, um, we're looking at a chronic granulomatosis inflammation disease involving any part of the GI. So the important thing is that you can have it anywhere. Um, typically it attacks at the distal portion of the ileum at the ileocecal valve. So um, the CDC states 201 cases in 100,000 people, and it's increasing every year, though. It's unregulated GI immune response to food and environmental factors, thickening of the bowel, uh, small ulcers, and can give you fistulas. And um, it gives a cobblestone and a string sign for a radiographic appearance. So cobblestone, string sign, regional enteritis, which is Crohn's disease. So drug therapy um, we use to reduce the inflammation, and we will do bowel resections um, based on necrotic bowel. All right, so you can see the appendix here and um, normal, and then you can see here, this is the string sign. You can see how narrowed it is coming in um, to the large bowel. It's just really, really narrowed, and it's narrowed due to the inflammation. So a um, lot of pain with this, a lot of pain. And we're looking at um, MR enterography. And this is kind of cool. We've got a spot right there. So you can see how pretty. We can see the bowel lumen really, really well with the contrast. And here it is right here. All right, appendicitis. Inflammation of the appendix causes uh, usually a fecal lith, which is a little stone or neoplasm. Most common abdominal surgical emergency in the United States. Um, initially pain in epigastrin that moves and persists in the right lower quadrant. It's really good to diagnose with CT and ultrasound, and you need to take the appendix out. So this is a really sick appendix. And you can see here's your ileum coming into your cecum and your appendix hangs off just the end right there. So um, appendicitis, there's a fecal lith right there. So believe it or not, that's the appendix and that is your uh, appendical lith, which is if you see a appendical lith, that patient has appendicitis. They go hand in hand. And right here you can see you can see the appendicle lift. And this is a pregnant woman. So you can see the baby. Here's an arm. Here's the legs. Here's the belly. You got the brain right here and the eyeball. <laughs> so cute. Look at the little smile. So this patient is positive for appendicitis. Oh, man. All right. Ulcerative colitis, um, unknown etiology. Um, we usually diagnose it with a sigmoid um, oscopy. Well, we'll do a colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy. Um, we'll also see it on an air contrast barometer. You have to be careful that you don't perforate the bowel. So we have ulcerative colitis and regional enteritis. So with ulcerative colitis, we have disease of the mucosa of the colon, begins at the anus and ascends, often results in megacolon and bowel perforation, um, and it can frequently progress to cancer. So regional enteritis affects all layers of the bowel wall, whereas um, ulcerative colitis just does the mucus. So regional enteritis, in, enteritis begins at the terminal ileum and the cecum and descends 
with often um, skipped areas. We call them skip lesions. So um, it's, it's spotty throughout, but it goes from the terminal ilium or the cecum towards the anus, whereas ulcerative colitis starts at the anus and goes backwards, okay? So in regional enteritis, rarely produces megacolon or bowel perforations. All right, esophageal varices. So varicose veins of the esophagus that occur in patients with portal hypertension. A lot of that portal hypertension is from drinking. So um, we usually diagnose it through a um, esophagram or a barium swallow, the patient with uh, laying on their back, thin barium. Uh, it looks like worm, a worm defect. So you can see here these, these streak lines. This should be solid white. It should not have these streak lines. So that is um, esophageal varices. So it's swelling of the veins due to the portal hypertension. So we can do a TIPS procedure um, where we bypass um, the, the pressure from the going to the liver. And what it does is the liver can't process all of that. So it backs up and the veins dilate and they dilate around the esophagus. So when you do a TIPS, you're going in and bypassing that. So you don't have the dilatation of the veins in the esophagus. So my uncle, he was an alcoholic and he actually died of this. So he ruptured three or four times in the ICU, getting a ton of blood. And then finally he ruptured and they couldn't stop the bleeding and he died. So it is serious. Um, you'll see it a lot with patients that are alcoholics, um, drinkers with liver failure. And you can see the worm-like indentations and that is backup of blood. All right, degenerative disease. So there's herniation, the protrusion um, of a part of an organ through a small opening um, in the wall or cavity. There's inguinal, femoral, umbilical. So it's just a weakness in the muscle wall. So the complications of it is that it can become incarcerated and strangulated, which means that it is trapped and it's twisting upon itself and it's losing blood supply. Therefore, one, you'll have small bowel obstruction or obstruction based on wherever it's at. And two, it's a surgical emergency, emergency because you're getting gangrene. So that's not good. All right, um, so a hernia is a protrusion of the stomach into the thoracic cavity, the hiatal hernia, the cavity through the esophageal um, hiatus. There's director sliding, and you'll see a Schottsky's ring every time. So you'll get a little ring right up here showing that um, you have a sliding hiatal hernia. There's rolling or parasophageal. So this is parasophageal. So you can see here's the diaphragm, and you're seeing stomach up here in the lung field. So there should not be any stomach above the diaphragm. It should be below the diaphragm. So that's parasophageal. Kind of cool. All right, bowel obstructions. So it, bowel obstructions um, are a blockage somewhere in the system. It, there's the mechanical. It can be a gallstone ileus, a volvulus, or in a susception. It can be paralytic, so um, abdomen distension, cramping, vomiting. Um, you'll see air fluid levels on a radiograph, and the visible gas pattern will be different on the intestines. So nasal gastric suction and medical stimulation, trying to get that going. <coughs> Excuse me. So in a susception, so a gallstone ileus is where there's a big gallstone, and it blocks um, the passage of food and digestive juices. So here, <clears throat> excuse me, the small intestines, this is called intussusception, where the bowel telescopes inside of itself, inside of itself. So that is intussusception. Bobulus is where the bowel twists upon itself. So it spins around and around and around, and it looks like a cinnamon roll to me. And when it twists upon itself, it's cutting off the blood supply. So painful. So you can see here, We've got twisting, we've got, ooh, ooh, this looks like an apple core lesion. So here's a lesion within the large bowel. Ooh, look at all this. So you see all these? This is not good, not good. So all of that is um, in the liver. So this person has what looks like an apple core lesion, which is a colon cancer, and it is throughout, oh, say it. 
All right, gallstone ileus. So looking here, we have, see the shelving? So I have a straight line with gas above it. That is, um, that is signs of a, an obstruction. And this is from a gallstone ileus. Oh, here's an obstruction. This is a good one. See all these really dilated loops of bowel? So that is um, paralytic ileus. So we've got a, an obstruction there. All right, neurogenic disease, so achalasia. So that's a neuromuscular abnormality of the esophagus that results in failure of the lower sphincter, esophageal sphincter of the distal esophagus to relax. So slowly progressive dysphagia in both solids and liquids may also experience regurgitation, chest pain, weight loss. Um, you get a bird beaked, so a beaked appearance of the distal esophagus. We go through and we dilate the esophagus. So one thing about achalasia is that this is the sword swallowers. So these are the people that have the really big dilated um, esophagus where they can swallow those swords that you see them in the circus. All right. So here's your bird beak appearance right here. And this gets really big and dilated. So here's your beaked appearance. Here's another one. So you can see it's very narrowed and you have um, dilation of the esophagus. So we have here, um, we have esophageal diverticula occurs when the mucosal outpouchings penetrate through the muscular layer of the esophagus. So diverticulum is a pouch or sac that occurs normally uh, created by herniation of the mucosal membrane through the defect in the muscular coat. Diverticulosis is the presence of diverticula without inflammation. So diverticulitis is the actual inflamed diverticulum, okay? So symptoms usually asymptomatic until they reach large in size, which causes um, complications and you need to modify your diet, diet and you can do surgical resection. Um, so diverticulum, diverticulosis, and diverticulitis can be anywhere within the digestive system most common in the sigmoid colon but it's this is esophageal diverticulum okay so if we're looking here at a pulsion um, and a zincers which is a type so you can see this big outpouching right here so this should be smooth just like this coming all the way down so this is a zincers so what happens is the patient will have food and fluid trapped in here, and then they'll lay down and it'll drip down into the lungs or they'll start coughing, 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 coughing. So this is a zincers. You can see here, here, coming with this swallow mechanism, sorry. So right here and right here. So a lot of times we have to put them in a lateral or a bleak in order to see it. All right, traction diverticulum. So originates from scar or pulls towards it making a triangle appearance. So it's from scar tissue. So you can see it right there. So here's the triangle. So right here, triangle. Kind of cool. Um, there's uh, two types of diverticulum. There's pulsion and traction. So pulsion is the mucosal layer of the esophagus only. So upper and lower one third of the esophagus and it's mo motility disorder. So zincers diverticulum found at the pharyngeal junction at the upper end of the esophagus and the Killian Jameson diverticulum originates on the lateral aspect. So traction is all layers of the esophagus. It's the middle third and results from adjacent scar tissue that pulls esophagus towards the area of involvement and it appears as a triangle. All right, so colonic diverticula, um, diverticula that occurs in weak area of the bowel wall, most commonly found in the sigmoid, also termed left-sided appendicitis, which I never heard of that before, but okay. Uh, diverticulitis, inflammation of the diverticulum and symptoms is left lower quadrant pain, tenderness, fever, fever is the key thing there, and increased white blood cell count, and CT is better than a BE. Uh, treatment is antibiotic therapy and resection of the bowel if it's a big problem. So all of these here are little out pouches, so this is your diverticulum, diverticular disease. So if it was inflamed, it'd be diverticulitis, OK? 
Okay, so this all these little out pouches, all of those. Okay, neoplastic disease, tumors of the esophagus, most common in the lower one third. There's the Barrett's esophagus, which I mentioned. It's a pro progressive um, uh, metaplasia of the distal esophagus as a result of chronic reflux. So leomyomas are a smooth muscle tumors. They're usually benign. They're diagnosed with CT, and the treatment is surgical resection if they're causing problems. There's adenocarcinomas, which is malignant. So um, adenocarcinomas are bad, and they have bad, poor diagnosis or prognosis. So um, usually we find we have to biopsy it. We'll use CT and um, endoscopes, sonography to see them. So leomyomas, they have nice smooth margins, so you can see just real smooth. You can see this would cause a problem in a patient trying to swallow food. Um, so benign. When we look at adenocarcinomas, you can see it's more chewy. Um, it's not a smooth margin. So you look at here, you can see it up close. Um, there's Barrett's esophagus right here. So the distal third, and you can see how it's kind of chewy gooey all over. Um, you'll hear me say chewy gooey. Chewy gooey means it's not smooth. Okay, so it's chewy gooey. Yeah. All right, tumors of the stomach, most are malignant, so um, gastro adenocarcinomas, 95% of them are, and the uh, symptoms are bleeding, vomiting, weight loss, um, early, um, anyway, upper GI is the best way. Um, they'll stick a scope down there and biopsy it, so you'll find radiographically rigidity and of paralysis and feeling defects on compression. So when we, when we compress the anatomy, when we compress the stomach, it's not going to be soft and moldable. It's going to stay firm. That's a bad sign. So if we look here, this is gastric cancer right here. All right, so if we're looking here, we've got uh, small bowel neoplasms. So very rare, represent less than 5% of gastric neoplasms, most common the duodenum and the proximal jejunum, um, if they're gonna have them. Um, Anyway, Carposi sarcoma is the most common in um, AIDS patients. So, um, so with small bowel neoplasms, we'll have abdominal pain, which is similar to cramping. Um, we're usually looking for Crohn's when we hear this, um, and we'll resect for both benign and malignant tumors. Polyps. All right, so. A diverticulum is an outpouching. A polyp, it grows inside the bowel. Okay, so it's a growth on the inside. So it's a tumor of benign neoplastic epithelium that may undergo dysplastic changes and become malignant. So um, there's a sisal, which is attached to the bowel wall with a wide base, and pedunculated, which is attached with a narrow stalk. So we take a look and see, um, we usually biopsy all. Um, polyps. So looking here, you can see this is going on the inside of the bowel, and you can see inside of the bowel. Inside of the bowel, inside of the bowel. It's not good. There's a little one right there and one right there. All right, adenocarcinoma is most common type of colorectal cancer, and you'll find um, blood in the stool, and it's not usually red blood, it's usually a dark, deep red blood, and it's found in the stool, it's not active bleeding. So we'll talk about soft, our varices of the anus, and um, we call them hemorrhoids. The, that will give you bright red blood. This is dark red blood, so this is GI bleed. Okay, so, um, here we're looking at napkin ring or apple core lesions. So polyps here, um, let's see, a tumor of benign neoplastic uh, epithelium may undergo, sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, we have here, this is a colon cancer, okay, right here. It's called an apple core lesion. And the reason why it's called apple core is because it looks like you ate the apple, so you have the top and you have the bottom and here's the middle. So it's third most common uh, tumor of the GI system, and it is the third most common cause of cancer and mortality. By the time we find this, it's metastasized. <coughs> All right, your pathology summary. 
This has all of the basic information on the different pathologies. So we did good. There's a lot to know about all of your pathologies of the GI system. There's a lot of them. The main thing is that I just want you to be able to tell, is it normal or is it abnormal? Something doesn't look right. You can always look up these pathologies. All right, good job.